Hello, I'm Joseph Scott Morgan. I wanted to take just a moment to talk to you about the Ellen Greenberg case from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. On January the 26th, 2010, Ellen, who was a school teacher by trade, was found deceased in her locked apartment by her then fiance. Uh, when she was discovered uh, after the door had been broken down, uh, she was found seated on the floor of her kitchen. A cutting board was nearby. There was diced up fruit uh, as if she was preparing a meal. And she was seated upright uh, at the time in which she was initially observed. One of the things that we like to focus on in forensics, and particularly medical legal death investigation, is to determine the PMI, or the postmortem interval. In Ellen's case, there's not an indication in the physical record uh, that there was a representative uh, from the medical examiner's office that attended the scene. Now, we do know, in fact, that the police were there in attendance and had observed her body uh, at the scene. But again, uh, from a medical examiner's perspective, we don't know how her postmortem interval was actually measured because it's not addressed. It's certainly not addressed in the autopsy report, and I'll get to that in just a second. But what are we looking for in a case like Ellen's death? Well, first off, we we want to know uh, how warm or, or cool uh, a body is because this is a measurable factor in time since death because bodies, we know, do in fact cool at a predictable rate dependent upon their environmental conditions. That's referred to as the ambient environmental condition. So if, if you're deceased in a house that is, say for instance, uh, 72 degrees, uh, your body will essentially cool down uh, until it hit, hits that ambient environmental uh, temperature. But in her case, in Ellen's case, there is no specific reference to body temperature. And this is important because time is a factor from the moment she was last seen alive uh, until the moment in which she was discovered. Uh, we know that, for instance, the body will potentially lose uh, up to two degrees of uh, body temperature uh, that is decreased uh, by uh, two degrees uh, for essentially the first hour following death. And that's significant. So how do we achieve this? Well, with body temperature, there's a couple of different ways that this is achieved. And generally, someone from the medical examiner's office will be there to perform what's called a core body temperature. And that is simply uh, a simple incision uh, uh, adjacent to the liver and the anterior aspect, uh, below the anterior aspect of the rib cage will be made and a thermometer will be inserted and you'll try to attempt to uh, assess what the core body temperature is. Remember the liver is a very dense organ so it's going to retain uh, uh, heat and energy and that sort of thing and it'll bleed off very quickly as opposed to say for instance our fingers uh, which uh, you know uh, temperature, the heat, will be dispersed rather quickly. Uh, and then there's an external way uh, that we achieve this as well, and that's either through uh, uh, an auditory, auditory canal temperature uh, where we can measure the temp. We can do what's referred to as an axillary temp where we simply take a thermometer, place it beneath uh, the left or the right armpit, and assess. But again, that's, that's not very accurate because it doesn't go to the central question, which is core body temperature. Another thing that we look for, which again was not addressed in Ellen's case, um, is going to be postmortem lividity or liver mortis, um, which is the gravitational settling of blood. Remember what I said earlier, Ellen's body, when she was observed, was observed seated upright against the cabinet. Well, the distribution pattern of the settling of the blood could be expected to be found, say for instance, if you're seated, just think about if you're in a chair right now watching this, it's blood will settle to the lowest point of gravity. So in a chair, for instance, uh, you're going to have blood, a uh, deceased person will have blood that will settle around their ankles, the soles of their feet, and, and then of course the backs of their legs where they're actually uh, close to contact uh, with a chair, maybe 
maybe their lower back. And after a period of time, uh, that um, lividity will fix. And that is significant because it takes uh, a certain number of hours for it to fix. And you can get this, this idea that the tiny little blood vessels that are meant to move blood now become these little setup areas for storage of blood. And of course, they're not created for that. The little capillary beds uh, can literally begin to burst in those areas because it's just absolutely engorged with blood. And the tissue itself will become stained. Interstitial staining actually is a real thing. And uh, the lividity will not migrate at that point. It'll stay fixed. And that's one of the things we look for when we show up at a scene to see if someone has manipulated the body, moved it around in any way, because you can get multiple presentations. Again, I have to emphasize, this is not addressed in the context of the scene from the reports that I've seen. But even when you read the autopsy report, it's not addressed there either. Uh, I, I guess, and finally, one of the things that we like to look at is the degree of rigidity. You know, how stiff is a body, um, you know, uh, in, the, in the joints, the major joints, in the jaw, for instance. And this is, of course, what many people understand to be rigor mortis. And it takes, again, um, a set amount of time uh, for rigidity to set in. And again, in Ellen's case, there's no indication of this data from the scene that we have viewed thus far. Um, and there's no indication of it in her autopsy report. Now, there's one other area that we look at relative to PMI, remember post-mortem interval, and that is, in fact, we look at stomach contents at autopsy. Unfortunately for us, um, the, the pathologist did address as to whether or not the stomach uh, contained anything, and it did. Uh, her stomach was completely empty, so uh, there is a time factor that's associated with that. All of this information is essential in order to conduct a thorough medical legal death investigation. Thanks for listening.